Uh, hi, everyone. There is uh, always uh, lots of performance stuff going on in Dialog, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, our search functions. So search functions is not really an official term, uh, but it's kind of a way of grouping. The idea of a search function is that you have, um, you have an array, and you have another array of values, and you're going to look at from the second array one at a time. Uh, the second array is the principal array, and I'll call each value a target value. And you look into the principal array to find each target. Uh, so the simplest of these is uh, membership, which just says, uh, is the target there at all? So I search for it. If I found it, I return 1. If not, I return 0. Slightly more complicated is uh, index of, which says, if it's there, I, I'd actually like to know where it is. Um, if not, give me the length of the array plus quad IO. Uh, and the third is uh, much newer. Interval index um, is, uh, well, I think a lot of people don't realize uh, both how simple interval index is and how useful it is. All it really says is, I have one sorted array. My principal argument is sorted. And I have, uh, for each target, I'd like you to find where it goes in that sorted order and give me an index that uh, says where it belongs. OK, I've been, um, I've been talking about these in terms of one whole principal argument and a single target value. And so you might uh, be kind of thinking in terms of the non-principal argument as the smaller one. But actually, most of what I'm going to talk about today is the case where we have a short principal argument and a lot of targets, meaning a long non-principal argument. So that's like uh, we have a small fixed set. Um, an example is maybe uh, I have all the digits, and I want to know, um, and then I have a longer vector array, and I want to know where in that set each element belongs. So uh, we've done a whole bunch of work on these, uh, on these short principal arguments set search functions. Uh, so you can see here this first expression. It's um, grouping your values. Here's another case of interval index. So you have uh, some boundaries, and you're grouping your values and saying, which of these uh, intervals between them does it go in? Uh, so for each value, I want to know whether it's 0 to 25, or 25 to 40, or 40 to 50, and so on. Uh, and this you can see. It's been made uh, about five times as fast since Dialog 16. Here's another case. Uh, this is common in text processing. If you want to, uh, this is the first step in finding the nesting level in terms of parentheses of a string. Uh, first, you need to identify whether each character is a left parenthesis, a right parenthesis, or neither, and then get uh, a number based on that. And that's been made almost three times faster. Uh, and here's another case. I have a list of six dates, say um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of uh, the last two weeks. And I want to know for each date whether it's one of those. So this is a pretty common sort of thing to do, a short principal argument. And in fact, uh, all of these cases are now implemented using the same algorithm, which was uh, based on just me thinking about how you might do interval index faster. And it turns out that this implementation of interval index is faster than anything you might think of for index of or membership. So the, the classical algorithm for interval index is a binary search. If you have a single target and you want to know where it goes in a sorted list, that's, um, that's really the only uh, good way to do it. Well, there are better ways if you know maybe how the data is arranged. But uh, the idea, it's really a simple concept. Uh, you're going to do a series of comparisons. And each time, you split the sorted argument in half. And you say, I want to uh, figure out which side it's on, and just keep doing that. So here, for example, we have a target Q. And I want to know where it falls in this 16 element list, 15. Um, so first, I'm going to compare it to the middle element, U. And I say, well, q is less than u, so it needs to fall on the left. 
it can have index seven or below. And maybe I should explain these uh, indices. So probably the hardest thing about interval index is understanding what the indices in the output mean. And you can see there's this kind of skewed relationship between possible results and possible inputs, because actually there's uh, one more possible result than you have elements in the principal argument. Uh, the name for interval index comes from the idea that this principal argument here splits the space of all arrays you might consider into intervals. So there's the interval that starts at k and ends right before m, the interval that starts at m and ends before p, and so on. And, um, well, two other special intervals, the one that starts at y and doesn't end, and the one that consisting of everything before e. And so you're going to uh, you just want to know which interval it falls in, and these intervals are sorted, so you want to know the index of that interval. And actually, the indices that I've written, uh, this is very off character for me, I've written the indices for the quad IO1 version of interval index, uh, where each index corresponds to the quad IO1 index of the element that starts that interval. Uh, and the reason for this is that it's actually, um, I find this definition is much easier to work with. So I think it was uh, maybe incorrect to have two different definitions based on quad IO. And in fact, we probably should have just used this one regardless of quad IO. The really nice property about this is that the index that you get is the total number of elements that are less than or equal to your target. So the, how binary search works is we're going to compare with the middle of the list and we say, well, Q is less than U, so it has to be, it can be interval seven or it can be less. So now we have a list of seven elements to compare against. And we pick the middle, M, it's greater than M. So it could fall in this index starting at M or it could be later. Compare again, it's less than T, or it's, it's equal to Q. And now that means it can be in the same interval as Q, but it could also be later. Or, well, no, it actually couldn't be later. Uh, but we're not going to stop here because if we tested, uh, so all these comparisons, it's possible to do them without any branches. Um, it changes which, which half of the list I'm considering, but it doesn't change what code I'm running. If we tested against Q to say stop here, that would change what code I'm running. And so because it's unpredictable, we don't know when we'd stop, this would give us a big penalty for branch misprediction. So you don't want to stop here. You should just keep going. You say, well, it's greater than or equal to Q, and that's all I care about. And then compare with T, it's less. So it has to fall in this interval and have index six. So this is a perfectly good algorithm. Um, asymptotically, it's, uh, it's fine. It's, if you do it right with these branchless comparisons, it takes about a nanosecond per comparison. So here we have four comparisons. Uh, that means it'll be about four nanoseconds for each target element. If you have one target element, four nanoseconds, two, eight nanoseconds. If you have three, it'll be 12 nanoseconds. And you know, Grace Hopper doesn't just hand these things out anymore. Uh, <laughs> this is taking so many nanoseconds. Uh, and I, I would like to instead maybe take uh, less than a nanosecond per element. You might have guessed this from the title. Uh, well, how do I do that? It's definitely, it's definitely not by speeding up these individual comparisons. There's just no way to, to check a value and consider whether you're less than it or not and do all that faster. Instead, what I'm going to do is try and process multiple targets all at once using vector instructions. So the central instruction that I need for this is vector selection, which is pretty much exactly like uh, APL selection except that you can only select from a 16-element vector of bytes, and uh, you get to use uh, 16 indices all at once. And um, this actually, uh, it's actually faster than selecting from memory because it doesn't hit memory at all because you select from a register. It takes just one cycle, which uh, this machine here does three and a half billion cycles in a second, so uh, that sounds good on the nanosecond front. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, the one thing about this vector selection, it is kind of awkward 
because you can only select bytes uh, using your indices. So we'll see later how you work around that if maybe your data is not single bytes, but it's two byte integers or four byte integers. Okay, so let's suppose I have, again, um, 15 elements in my principal argument. This will fit into a single vector, and I have one element over here, which is uh, just a fill, um, and I have a whole vector now of targets. And I've only drawn half the vector just so you can actually see what's going on, but there would actually be 16 elements here, so we'd be doing 16 binary searches all at once. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up another vector of indices. I'm going to initialize them all to point at the middle of this vector, index 8. Um, and then the way I use this for a comparison is I perform this vector selection. So I select a whole bunch of copies of element 8 from the target vector. And then I'm able to do a vector comparison of all these values against the targets. So now I do all these comparisons. And I had initially I, the value, all these indices were 8. That had one bit set at the top and then three empty bits. So I'm going to remove that top bit whenever uh, the element was less than, whenever the comparison came out less, and um, otherwise leave it alone. And then I'm going to add another bit in the middle. So you can see now I have two possible values depending on this top bit, and they're still uh, in the midpoints of the, of the range that I'm considering. And I can do the same thing again. Now the selection is actually doing something. So some of these elements, uh, I select uh, principal argument uh, index number four, and some I select number 12, and I do the exact same comparison. And now there are four possible values. Uh, and I can do this again, choose again, and you see gradually the, um, the elements that come earlier are starting to, their index is getting lower, and the ones that come later, the index is getting higher. Everything's kind of getting sorted. And then the last one is the same, except I don't add a bit at the end. So you can actually maybe think, uh, Maybe interval index should be quad IO one half. I should have added a half there. Um, and now uh, you can check uh, all these elements. They're in the right interval. So uh, that's really nice. I've done 16 binary searches all at once. And my requirement is that, uh, well, for the algorithm that I showed you, it can only be a single vector register here. But you can actually extend this to any number of vector registers. The issue is that to do a selection from, say, two, two registers, you have to touch both of them. So your selection is no longer constant time. So you're kind of limited in the number of registers you can use. Practically, uh, no more than four is the rule. So that means I can work with uh, four registers of 16 bytes, which is pretty good. Uh, now what if I want to uh, work with multi-byte data, like four-byte integers here? Uh, well, I'm kind of, actually the code is pretty much exactly the same. Uh, what I'm going to do is instead of initializing all the indices to 8, I'm going to have groups of four indices and set the bottom two bits so that they're 0, 1, 2, and 3. So then these point to the individual bytes in the integers in the target. And now you can see selection works the same, uh, but instead of a one-byte comparison, I need to use a four-byte comparison. And after that, uh, now, a vector comparison is kind of interesting because uh, rather than returning a 1 or a 0 like you might expect, it returns a 0 or a minus 1, uh, which in binary has all the, one, all the bits set. It's just a bunch of 1s. And uh, here that's really useful because it means I don't have to worry about propagating a 1 result to the rest of the bytes. It's just all the bits are 1. So I can do the exact same. Um, what I do is mask off the top bit based on the comparison result. So I have the same he thing here. This 565 was greater than 70, so it moved that way. Um, and I do this again. And um, yeah, the unfortunate thing about having larger data is that now I can only, I can't have as many steps of my binary search. So before I could fit uh, 15 whole keys in a register, and I had to have this empty value because um, well, that's, that's just the way the, the arithmetic with the number of comparison works. And here I can only fit three. 
Uh, my other registers, I'll be able to fit four. So the next register will actually be the values that go in here and between these two and between these two and so on. Um, but so I, ha I have half as many searches that I can do, and also I'm only working on half as many elements at a time. But uh, this is still very useful. This is still faster than any other method I know of. Um, so yeah, let's look at uh, how these all perform. Uh, the nice thing about this chart is that uh, it's in picoseconds, which uh, they're a thousandth of a nanosecond. And I, there are, some of them are, are more than a nanosecond, but pretty much. This is like 96% all, all of the things using this algorithm are in picoseconds, so I, I pretty much lived up to the title here. Um, the, uh, this graph is in terms of I have both the size of the elements that I'm using, one byte, two byte, and four byte data. This will work on characters as well as integers. Um, and I have the number in my argument. Now, if I have just one, uh, this is kind of special because this is actually just a single comparison, which we already had special code for. And that uses uh, not just 16 byte registers, but 32 byte registers using AVX. So it's uh, around twice as fast, I would expect. Um, and this last row, this is the uh, general purpose method. So for, um, for say, two byte membership, you can make a table of bits that uh, has one bit for every possible two byte integer and do lookups into that. And actually, for one byte membership, you can get really fancy and put this whole table. It only has 256 entries, so you can put it all in vector registers and do lookups, and that's really nice, too. Um, the, uh, yeah, so that's, that's our um, binary search, and that's one very nice algorithm for sub-nanosecond lookups. The next thing I'm going to talk about, how I got this square. Because I can't just do a lookup table for these. These are four byte integers, and there are uh, billions of them. So I'd rather not make a lookup table. That would take forever. Uh, well, let's, um, let's zoom out and just see the bigger picture, what's uh, really going on with these lines. Here is my uh, performance graph for, um, for index of and membership. We were over here. This graph, um, so previously, we only cared about, uh, we didn't even have an axis for the non-principal argument. This is just if the non-principal argument is large, how much time does it take to look up each target? So I'm assuming there are millions or something. I think I did my timings on a million. Um, in this case, I'm looking at both the principal argument. So the left side is as the principal argument gets larger, and the right side is as the non-principal argument uh, gets smaller. So I'm graphing a million total elements. Uh, and unfortunately, the scale's in nanoseconds now. But we're only, I, I promise, we'll only look at the part that's, no, that's not true. We're going to see this part, too. But we'll see, we'll see this part. Um, so, yeah, this is a graph of the times of membership in IOTA. And here's version 17, uh, which is pretty good, really. This is uh, not necessarily a state-of-the-art hash table, but this is what you'd get if you implemented Knuth competently. Um, and it's pretty good. It does uh, 10 to 20 nanoseconds per lookup. But um, in version 18, the lookups are just really crazy fast. Membership goes at... Uh, under a nanosecond, even with like a thousand, almost two thousand arguments, elements in the principal argument. Um, should uh, make some more comments on this graph. So uh, you may be worried about the middle of the graph. I am not so worried about the middle of the graph. Uh, the, uh, the reason for this is that I don't think it's really that common to do a set function with a huge left argument and a huge right argument. It's almost always the case that either you have a big list and you're searching for a few elements, and that goes over on this side, which I'm not going to discuss, but this, the, the fact that I got 
this down here re also requires a really cool algorithm. Um, or you've got, uh, or you're doing a lookup like I talked about, where you have a small set and you're looking at a lot of elements into that set. Um, there are maybe a few cases which do fall in the middle, and um, one of the prominent ones is when you have uh, a long list of integers and you want to know its index, uh, you want to do an iota selfie, so omega, iota, omega, and figure out what the index of each element is in the list itself. Uh, and that's actually handled by different code. And uh, any other case, I think, is probably actually going to fall into the small range case, where the total range of the data is uh, twice the length of the arguments or less. So in practice, I don't think you'll see this sort of behavior often. It should usually be these uh, very fast lookups. The other comment I have about this is that if you'd uh, like to compare this to other hash tables, they will often have graphs like this, except they don't have the right half because they don't know how many lookups they're doing ahead of time. Uh, so you'll see they'll have a graph like this that goes um, probably further than into the millions, into the billions. Uh, and typically they'll show the performance uh, when you found the element you're looking for and when you didn't. And that's uh, very misleading because actually the main cost here is uh, knowing whether you found an element or not because there's a branch there and the branch uh, misprediction is all the expense. So in fact, if you find every element that you're looking for, this goes down to about four nanoseconds for each lookup. And if you don't find any of the elements, it goes down to one and a half nanoseconds for each lookup. So, um, and both those numbers are, are much faster than any other hash table I know about. So, onward, we are looking at this little section of the performance graph. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about kind of my general strategy here. There's a technique called uh, Robin Hood hashing, which is fairly old, but has only really caught on recently. Uh, first, uh, for those of you that don't know uh, what a hash table is, a hash table is basically how you'd search for things if you always remembered where you put stuff. Um, the idea of a hash table is, uh, well, when you're creating a hash table, you have a bunch of items and you want to be able to look each one up. So you take, uh, a hash function and apply it to the item and get an index into a table. And you just put the item there in the table. And then later, if you want to look it up, you hash it again and you take the index you found and look there in the table. And, oh, it's there where I left it. Good. Uh, the one problem that hash tables have uh, is that uh, two elements might get the same index in the table. There's no way to guarantee that everything gets its own index. Um, without just having a bigger table than the number of possible elements, which is usually not practical. Um, so the typical strategy for this, well, I'll show how our hash table handles it. If you, you have an item and it has some index in the hash table where you want to put it. If there's nothing else there, you can just put it there. Um, the typical strategy, if there, um, if there is something in the way, is you'll keep on looking until you find an empty slot. You just move along the table, increasing your index, uh, and put it there. Um, there are also some other ways that you can do this. Uh, this, this is called linear pro probing, and why it's nice is that uh, it's very good for the cache that you're only looking in one sort of region to place your element. There are other ways to do this where if you don't, um, if the spot you're looking for is filled, maybe you pick another random spot and go into the table or you, um, or you try a strategy that will make sure that you, that you won't um, just keep looking into this clump of values. Uh, but linear probing is very important for, the, for being better for the cache. So in a modern hash table, it's the way to do it, even though theoretically it Makes, um, it makes you have to do look at more values. But the Robin Hood strategy is um, actually 
makes this much better. It makes this much less of a problem. The idea is that you're going to keep this uh, second number, this displacement that tells how many values you've searched through. And then, if you find uh, the slot is already occupied by something with a greater displacement, you move on and you increase your displacement. So year one is less than two, we'll do that again. And if you find um, that you have a greater displacement, or they're equal, then you're allowed to kick out um, the element that's already there. Uh, and here, I've decided maybe there's a tiebreaker of uh, which element is actually first in alphabetical order, so G comes before O. And you'll store this element here and move the others down. And what this tends to do is make sure that the maximum displacement in the table is not so high. So with linear probing, you tend to have, a have a, the displacements go up higher. Uh, but this is not so much the case with uh, Robinhood hashing. Now, Robinhood did not actually use this algorithm. But it is known to the English, in fact. If you'll go to our office in Bramley and you'll find a traffic calming device in the roads where only one car can pass at a time, going in both directions, and you observe the behavior of the drivers there. Uh, what they do is when they arrive at the traffic calming device, they watch on the other side to see who's already there. And um, then they will, uh, well, they'll apply the Robin Hood strategy. They'll say, if a car on the other side has waited for longer, then they'll, they'll wait and they'll let it go. And if it has not waited for longer, then they'll say, oh, it's my turn. Um, so this is uh, pretty much the same. Now, the difference between uh, English people and programmers is that uh, the English drivers do this despite the fact that it does not speed up traffic at all. OK. Uh, but now, um, here's, this is still not actually my contribution to Robin Hood hashing. But here's a, um, a particular strategy that uh, is very useful with vector instructions. What we do is we say, well, this Robin Hood strategy is keeping our maximum displacement very low. So we'll, in fact, say, if anything would be displaced by more than 14 elements, we'll just put it in a secondary lookup structure, like a sorted list. This basically never happens. It never happens in our tests at all. Um, you can go up to uh, over a million elements, and you have to have a pretty high load factor in the table so um, to even kick out one element. It's, uh, it's not very likely. Um, and now that you have a maximum displacement of 14, there are 15 possible displacements. And there's also, you can have uh, a slot in the table be empty. So to store the displacement, or whether there's an element at all, just takes four bits. Uh, and we can make a table out of these displacements, only dis the displacements and not the values. So uh, because it's uh, not efficient to store just groups of four bits, we'll pad these out with four hash bits, bits that we got from hashing the value, but were, that we're not using for the index itself. Um, and we can use that to reduce false positive comparisons. So when we're looking into this uh, table, we see, we look at the first value, and um, if it have a, has a displacement of 0, then it could, be our, um, it could be the value we're looking for if the first one has a displacement of 1, and so on. But if we add these hash bits here, we also compare these. And so we reduce the chance of a false positive uh, down to 1 16th of what it was before. So when we test, um, now, uh, looking up in the hash table is split into two levels. We first check in the displacement table, and then we check in the table of values for anything that may have matched. And the really nice thing about this, and what I haven't seen anybody else do, is that you can actually uh, do this with a single vector comparison. You say, I'm going to construct, put all these displacements next to hash values, and do a vector comparison of each byte. And this gets you, for all 16, uh, well, this one doesn't count, for all 15 of the possible places that I could have stored my value, uh, is it actually, can it be there? And so chances are, if it's not, 
you just get a zero and you move on very quickly. That's how I can get this uh, false negative matching rate of just one and a half nanoseconds. And if it is, uh, probably you only have one value to check. So if you weren't using Robinhood hashing or these displacements or anything, you'd have to check this value, this value, this value, this value. And then finally, there's an empty slot so I, I can stop searching. Or maybe if it was actually here, you would stop here. In this case, you just search this one value, which is probably actually the right one. Uh, well, that's very nice. This, is, um, this gives us very fast lookups. But um, the really nice thing about this displacement table is, um, and this is for four byte membership in particular, that, that area on the graph that I showed you. As long as uh, you have a displacement table, the real nice thing about it is that you don't actually have to use it. Uh, because if you compute these displacements and uh, find that they're all less than four, which uh, with a thousand values is, is usually the case, uh, with 2,000 is maybe not. So it's good up to 1,000 to 2,000 values, which I think is probably the most common case with, um, with a short, shorter principal argument than non-principal argument. Uh, well, yeah, so then if, if the displacement is less than four, well, four four-byte keys fits in a single vector register. That's 16 bytes. So you can actually skip the byte table, and you know it can only be in one of four possible places. So you say, I'll, I'll just go to the hash table directly and compare. Um, so the, the whole flow is you compute the hash and the index, and then you look it up in your hash table and pull a vector. And then, yeah, you need to compare the vector from the hash table to a vector that is packed with four of the keys that you're looking for. And then you take the result and you put it in your output. Um, so the thing about this is that we want to, uh, we need to use a scalar to compute our hash function, but we need to use a vector to compare. And moving between the scalar and the vector unit, uh, particularly uh, if, if you're not going to use uh, more later instruction sets, is very expensive. So I'd prefer not to do that. And the way I'm going to do that is to uh, just load four vectors at a time from the table and keep these in one register. And then when I want to compute my hash, well, OK, let's say first I'm looking up this value. So I want to compute my hash. So I load this out with a separate load. And then I also use another instruction to select four copies of this. And actually, uh, I could use the vector selection that I talked about. Um, but I'd have to, to compute a different selection mask for each of these. Uh, and also, this requires uh, Intel's triple SE3, as opposed to uh, just with SSE2, which is in every single machine that we support, x86 machine that we support. Uh, there's a nice instruction to, uh, to select four byte integers. The catch is that um, the indices have to be a constant. They're actually part of the instruction itself. So I'm going to do this whole loop four times with one constant that takes the first element four times, and one that takes the next element four times, and then one that takes the next element, and so on. Uh, and so my loop is unrolled a little bit. Uh, first, because I only want to do one load of all these four. And second, because I have to use this instruction with a hard-coded index. Uh, the hash function. I wrote a whole lot about this, but uh, I mean, this is just kind of, uh, you can download the slides and read it all later if you want. Uh, there's only really one choice of hash function, which is the uh, cyclic redundancy check instruction. And it's not designed as a hash function, but it works pretty well. Uh, it's, uh, it's as fast as a multiply. It has three cycle latency. The other trick that I need is um, I'm just uh, taking these values directly from the hash table. And so if I'm careless about how I initialize my hash table, if empty slots can be anything, then I could get a false positive by comparing to one of those empty slots. 
The way I avoid this is by having, um, I pick two values that I want to store in the hash table, and then I hash them, and then I store them away from that hash. So, uh, like here, I find a key that hashes to zero, and I store it everywhere that doesn't hash to zero. So if I'm looking it up, I'll take the hash, I'll say, good, the hash is zero. I look at these values, and um, they are different from zero, so no matches, which is good. And I have another key which hashes to minus one, which always, I use a power of two hash table length, because that's the only fast way to convert a hash to an index, is to do a bit mask. Um, so if something hashes to minus one, it'll end up at the end of the table. Uh, the other thing about this table, these tables is that uh, because there's a maximum displacement, most hash tables wrap around. So if you uh, look at the end of the table and you don't find your value, you go back to the beginning. In this case, I know there's a fixed number of searches that I have to do. So rather than wrapping, I just uh, let it continue off the end of the table. Uh, so here I know that minus one goes to the end of the table and it won't wrap around, so I put it at the beginning, and it can't cause false positives. Um, the other problem is, uh, remember my comparison, I'm comparing four four-byte integers, so it gives me a vector of four either zeros or ones, and I need to figure out whether any of these values was true, and then append them to my result. And what I'm actually going to do is do it uh, in the other direction. So I append each of these to a result, and then I'm going to combine these later. So uh, each of these results is 32 bits, and I, I'm going to not care what they are initially. I'll shift each of them left. I can use either a shift instruction or add it to itself. And then I will subtract the comparison from this, and this handily converts the minus 1 to a 1 and fills in this slot. And so I can keep doing this, and each time it either adds a 1 to one of these four results, or maybe it doesn't. Um, and then, once I'm done with all that, I'm going to take all these results together, just bitwise or them together, and then I have 32 bits that I can write to my result. So um, this uh, handily gives us a vector of bits, which is what Dialog uses, uh, a packed bit vector. Um, one of the things to note is that this is actually a big Indian bit order, which is the opposite of what uh, x86 uses. Uh, we made this decision so we write bits the same way you would write them left to right, but this is sort of backwards because it means that um, the bit that corresponds to 2 to the 7th is in position, uh, is in the position we call 0, the bit that corresponds to 2 to the 6th is in our position 1, and so on. But it does have this really nice effect that you can write bits quickly by pushing your intermediate results left and just adding to the bottom bit, because there's not any way to add to the top bit easily. So um, this works much better for us. And actually, this is even more useful in scalar code, because um, this whole thing, where you multiply one value by two and add another value, is a single instruction. OK, so our, our total algorithm, now it's, it's split into these three parts. It comes out to uh, just eight instructions. So we have uh, here we're going to compute a CRC, and we're going to do a bitwise AND with the length of our hash table minus 1. Uh, here we're going to use that index to load some values and compare them for equality. And here we're going to pin them to our vector. And we do this uh, four times in our loop. And then we do that loop eight times. And then we get 32 bits. And then we OR all those together. And then we write them to a result. But essentially, it's just these eight instructions for each bit that we need to uh, compute. Uh, but I said uh, that this machine is uh, three and a half gigahertz. So three and a half billion instructions per second. That doesn't sound like I'm under a nanosecond. Uh, you may be aware that, um, that computers do what's called pipelining. They can, um, they can do multiple instructions at once. 
But if I look at this, the uh, critical path here, this is the shortest I can possibly get from an input of the algorithm to an output. It goes through uh, six instructions, and even this CRC32 is actually three cycles, so all the others cost one. This is an eight cycle latency, which is definitely not under a nanosecond. So what's happening? Uh, well, the, the computer does some very cool stuff here. If you'll imagine four of these packed on top of each other, the, I said this was the critical path, but the thing is it doesn't depend on any of the other, each of these four parts that are executing in parallel can do this separately and so on. The only thing that depends on the previous step is this writing to the output. So, um, so like if you'll imagine four of these on top of each other, squished, uh, then you have these two instructions uh, packed together and these two and this. Now these three you might think are a problem, but they actually take place uh, in a register that's in just a temporary register. And even though in the assembly these all use the same register, the CPU determines that it's the temporary and uses a different register for each one so they don't overlap, even though this would take five cycles on its own. So we actually end up with this, um, the only latency cost here is these two instructions, two cycles. So finally, if I actually measure the performance here, uh, perf is this nice Linux tool that tells me uh, how a running program is performing. And it says, my CPU is running at not quite three and a half gigahertz. I want that uh, half percent uh, of my money back. Um, and it's also executing the, the maximum a CPU can possibly, an x86 CPU can possibly do is four instructions in a cycle. And it's nearly hitting that. So I showed our, our longest dependency would be two cycles. Uh, if you look at, we have eight instructions and 3.81 instructions per cycle. So that would be 2.10. And the actual performance, uh, if you look well under a nanosecond, 2.7-ish cycles. So even if your CPU runs at 2.7 gigahertz, you can probably still get sub-nanosecond performance with this. Uh, so that's it. We're, we're out of time. I, do I get to do anything else here? <laughs>